All right, turning your Bible this morning to uh, 1 Timothy, the book of 1 Timothy. We're going to start an expository study. We're going to go verse by verse through the entire book of 1 Timothy, all six chapters. And uh, as I stated in the last sermon, my wife and I are currently very busy trying to find some land. We're going to be doing a lot of traveling, doing a lot of driving, so I'm not going to be able to do uh, real extensive studies as I have been doing. Um, we are finding out some very, very, very uh, interesting information about the Sunday School movement, the Vacation Bible School, and uh, the coming army of the Antichrist. Now I get you all excited, you know, you're going, oh, I want to see that study. I know, I know. It'll come. But uh, it's also a good idea to just go verse by verse through books of the Bible. So that's what we're going to do today. 1 Timothy chapter 1. Okay. Let's start out here with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I just really pray that we would all be attentive to your word. Lord, I pray that uh, your Holy Spirit would guide and direct us into all truth. And that uh, if there are any things that I miss, Lord, then to brothers and sisters in Christ out there, they would put the things into the comments. And, and uh, Lord, I just pray that you would be here among us as we study your precious word. And I thank you for this Bible, Lord. I thank you for the King James Bible. The, that uh, so many people had to die for and suffer for so that we could have it in our hands. And I pray, Lord, that we would read this book and study this book and it would become part of us, Lord, part of our speech, part of our mind, that we would hide your word in our heart. And uh, so, Lord, I just pray all of these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, beginning in verse 1. It says here, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. Unto Timothy, my own son, in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. Okay? Now, it's very interesting there. What does Paul call Timothy? He calls him my own son in the faith. Now, if you want to go in your Bible to John chapter 3, turn there to John chapter 3. And uh, we're going to see why did, call, why, yeah, why did Paul call Timothy his son in the faith? You know, let's look about this. John chapter 3, verses 3 through 7 says, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, Ye must be born again. Okay? Timothy was born again in a spiritual sense, not a physical. Right? You can go back to 1 Timothy chapter 1 there. Um, and so when you lead somebody to the Lord... And you're there and you've, and you've witnessed to them and they get saved because of your witness. Spiritually, they're like a child to you. Okay, why? They're born again. You were there for the birth, the new birth. It's pretty neat. Okay, well then, then I guess Paul should be called Father Paul by Timothy, right? No, because you see you compare Scripture with Scripture. And you see where the Bible says that you're not to call any man Father. Okay? Now that doesn't mean you, can call, you can't call your birth father, hey, that's my father, because the Bible says, honor thy father and mother. What it's saying is a religious title, father, is wrong. Sorry to all the Catholic priests out there. You shouldn't be calling a Catholic priest your father, all right? especially because he hasn't you know, led anybody to the Lord. You know? it's, it's, uh, a Catholic priest can't, can't uh, make anybody be born again. All they can do is just make you eat a cookie over and over and over again and think you're getting saved. Doesn't work. All right? But notice there's something else that's interesting. And you'll see this all through the Bible, all through the New Testament. You'll see this, a reference to the Godhead. You know, three, but they're all one. Very interesting here. In verse 2, Unto Timothy, my own son in the faith. Now look at this. Grace, mercy, and peace. From God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. Okay? Isn't that interesting? Grace, mercy, peace. Three. 
And we're going to see that throughout 1 Timothy, the book of 1 Timothy. You'll see these references to three, three references there to the Godhead. Three descriptions, three things. Over and over and over again, you know, they say, you know, there's no support for a Trinitarian doctrine. Well, I'm sorry, but there is. Okay, this thing of three, but they're all one. It's all throughout the New Testament. Okay, now, I understand that the word Trinity is not in there, but we'll say, call it the Godhead. The Godhead is three in one. All right, you can listen to my study. Um, oh, I forget what the thing's even called now, but, it, but I talk about basically that man also has three parts to him. Body, soul, spirit. They're not all the same. All right. But uh, let's look here at 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3. As I besought thee, <clears throat> excuse me, as I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Timothy's job was to charge brethren to not teach false doctrine. Okay, that's what an elder is supposed to do. All right, a, a preacher, a man that, that preaches the word of God, that, that has oversight of a flock. He's supposed to warn people about false doctrine. And a good preacher is, is somebody that's going to safeguard his people from error and falsehood. A good preacher is going to spend a lot of time in the Word. A good preacher isn't going to stand up and say, let me tell you all these nice little cute stories about life and friendliness, friendliness and how to get along with the world and how to make good money from the world and how you can pay me money and stuff. That's not the job of a good preacher. A good preacher today is going to be worried sick about his congregation because he's going to see all the falsehood out there and he's just going to be like, wow, you know, how on earth am I going to warn these people? There's so many things I have to say to them. So many things I have to warn them about. All right? And you see it was there in the first century. Paul is telling Timothy, hey, you're supposed to, you know, charge them that they teach no other doctrine. Very important. First Timothy chapter 1, verse 4. Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edifying which is in faith, so do. All right, now turn in your Bible to Titus, the book of Titus. Back towards the back of your Bible there, a couple books over, you have the book of Titus. I have these verses, you know, typed out here just to, for sake of time. Um, so I'm not going to, you're not going to see me flipping in my Bible, but uh, Titus chapter 1, verse 9. Who's this thing about the fables and endless gene genealogies? Who's that talking about? Well, it says here in verse 9, Holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able to, by sound doctrine, both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision. Hmm. The Jews, in other words. Those Old Testament Jews. The Jews according to the flesh, you know, not spiritual Jews. Verse 11, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, The Christians are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. This witness is true, wherefore rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables. And we read there in verse 4, neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies. It says here, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. Now, it's very unfortunate, but there's a lot of Jews out there that have added a whole lot of things to the Bible. Okay? The average, if, you're, if you ever meet an Orthodox Jew, they don't believe this book. Okay? They believe the Old Testament, but then they don't believe the New Testament, but then they also add a bunch of stuff to the Old Testament. They add things like the Talmud, and they have all these other traditions of men that they've added in. And then you have the satanic aspect of it, where they're getting into the Kabbalah and some of the other things, messing around. So you got to watch out for that. And a lot of these people out there, that are out there today, this Hebrew Roots movement, they're coming in and they're trying to get you back under the Old Testament. And they'll try to say that it's not Jesus that you're saved by, it's Yeshua. And then they'll go to the next level of Yahashua. Well, Yahashua in Hebrew is Joshua. Now, Joshua did not die on the cross to pay for my sins. Okay, Jesus did. And you say, these people that say, if you believe in Jesus, you're believing in a pagan deity. Well, then you can go to hell. 
Just as simple as that. If you're believing in another name other than Jesus Christ, uh, you're on your way to hell. Just as simple as that. Jesus is the name which is above every name. Okay? And look at the world out there. They're banning the name of Jesus. Not of Yeshua or Yahashua or any of these other names that they come up with. And you see these guys too, they'll go to this Hebrew roots thing and they'll try to get you to go back under the law. Okay? That's what they do. And if it's not in the book, then it's a fable. And it's a commandment of men, a doctrine of men. All right? So watch out for that stuff. And, uh, of course, there you have, again, the thing that uh, uh, two of a preacher's concerns there, godly edifying and faith. All right? Part of the thing of your when you're preaching, when you're in ministry, you are supposed to exhort, you are supposed to teach doctrine, but you're also supposed to edify, which means to encourage, edifying, building them up, saying, hey, you're doing a really good job. I can tell you right now, if you're watching this channel and you're reading the King James Bible and you're listening to the old hymns, good job. You are heading towards the truth. Does that mean that I'm the end of, of all truth and that you can I'm perfect and I never make mistakes? No, I didn't say that. But what I'm saying is, this channel, you're not going to hear stuff from the new versions. You're not going to hear the deception, the lies of Rick Warren and Joel Osteen and whatever else. I expose those liars, those ministers of Satan. Okay, I'm not a hireling like a lot of the guys that have the buildings that cost a million dollars and they're trying to get you to help pay the mortgage. You know, that's not what you're going to get here. So if you're here, it's because you're looking for the truth. All right? So good job. Keep it going. All right? I, th I think one of the greatest things is when I see Christians that outgrow me. They learn from me. They can come along and they can study under me and under this ministry here. They learn from the, the sermons and whatever else. And they get to a point where they're feeding themselves the Word of God and they can go out and they can feed other people. They get into ministry. They learn how to how to go out on the street and talk with people and, and, you know, discuss things with them. That's wonderful. That's what you're supposed to be doing. If you're doing that, if you are serving the Lord in any capacity, good job. I can tell you that. I know there's a lot of things that are discouraging in this world and they get you down and all that, but you also need to be encouraged once in a while. So, and if you're not doing those things, by the way, I'm not going to yell at you and scream at you and say, you carnal, wicked, disgusting, hypocrite, you, you know. No, I'm not going to do that. What I'm going to say is, you can start today. If you've not been doing too good for the Lord, repent, confess it, forsake it, move forward. You can start over today. That's a beautiful thing. Get some gospel tracts, go to a stores or wherever, and put them down for people to read. There's a bench you know, in a store or something like that, go put a tract on it. You know, whatever. You can start small and grow your way up. All right? And if you're doing it, good job. Keep it going. The Lord will reward you for that. You cannot waste your time serving the Lord. But let's look here at 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. If you want to go back there, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5 says here, Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. Again, notice the number three in the verse. Okay, you have three things. First of all, you have charity out of a pure heart. Secondly, you have a good conscience. Thirdly, you have faith unfeigned. Let's look about this. Turn to Colossians chapter 3, verse 14. Charity is going to be one of the most important things that you need to develop as a Bible-believing Christian. Okay, you can read 1 Corinthians 13. That's the, book, that's the whole chapter on charity, the greatest chapter on charity. But this is a very important verse here in Colossians 3.14. It says, And above all these things put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. Now, you will never achieve perfectness as a Christian. But if that's what you're aiming for, and you're trying to be perfect, and you're trying to improve yourself every day, if you're always trying to do your very best, you're going to do good. If you just say, ah, good enough, ah, whatever, I don't care. Yeah, you're going to have problems. So, but how do you achieve perfectness as a Christian? Charity. You see, because charity is self-sacrificial love. Those times when you want to go out and you want to be outside on a beautiful day like today and, you know, go just have a good time, ride your bike, go for a walk in the park, uh, do whatever, go fishing, go hiking, 
whatever. But there's somebody that you need to write to or a sermon that you need to prepare or some studying that you need to do or you didn't read your Bible yet and you put the Lord first and you put other people first, that's charity. Those times when you really don't feel like going out tracting and you go out anyhow, that's charity. Those times when you come to people in the right spirit and you're witnessing to them and they're walking all over you and they're calling you names and they're yelling at you and you keep your cool and you say, you're going to stand before God someday and I don't want to see you go to hell. you know. And you come to them in love and charity. There again, that's charity. And those things, the more charity you have in your life, the more you will be heading towards that perfectness. Very important. What about a good conscience? Turn to Romans chapter 2. What's this thing of a good conscience? You see there, charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience. So let's look at that. Romans chapter 2 verses 14 and 15 says, For when the Gentiles which have not the law do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. Did you know that even a lost person has the laws of God written in their hearts? There aren't too many lost people that just say, I don't think that there's anything wrong with killing somebody. I don't see a problem with murder. You know, uh, well you should, you know, I mean, they have, what do they have to do to get to that point where they become a murderer? They have to sear their conscience. They have to tell their conscience, you know, I'm not going to listen to you. There aren't too many married couples out there that think adultery is fine. You know, there aren't too many people that like to be lied to. There aren't too many people that know that lying is a good thing. You know, you get down through the list there of the Ten Commandments, the law that's written in the heart of every man, woman, and child. The only people that are disobeying those laws are the ones that have seared that conscience. Now let me ask you a very pointed, very direct question here, brethren. It says a good conscience. Do you have a good conscience before God right now? Have there been things in the last week that you've looked at that you shouldn't have looked at? Things that might have uh, caused you to look and lust on a woman and the Bible says you've committed adultery with her already in your heart? Have you done that? If you're a woman, have you lusted on a man? How about lying? Have you lied to anybody this past week? Do you have a good conscience about it? You say, well, I lie to people all the time, brother, but it doesn't bother me. Then you've seared your conscience. And you're getting close to a reprobate mind. You say, well, a Christian couldn't be turned over to a reprobate mind. Uh, I think some could. And usually when you get to that point of being turned over to a reprobate mind as a Christian, you get so far away from the Lord, you're pretty close to getting killed by God. God might just have to take you home, you know, Make sure that you have a good conscience before God. You know, and you say, well, brother, I, I did some things this week, and I, yeah, you're right, I'm not proud of it. Okay, confess it, forsake it, move forward. Don't just confess it and then keep doing it. All right, that doesn't work either. You have to confess those sins, you have to forsake those sins, and then you have to move forward. Don't sit around and just glum and groom, oh, oh I can't believe I messed up for the Lord. I, I just can't believe I did that, huh? Oh, God's never going to use me. Oh, don't do that. Confess the sin, forsake the sin, and then get back to work for the Lord. Turn next to Hebrews chapter 11. How about faith unfeigned? What's that mean? Hebrews chapter 11. Again, the, the book of Hebrews there, chapter 11, you have faith being discussed. One of the greatest chapters in your New Testament on the subject of faith. And that's another thing that you need to do with your Bible study learn what different chapters in the Bible refer to different subjects so that you can turn right to them when somebody has a question. I'll give you an example. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, that's the chapter on marriage. All right? A lot of things about why you should marry, what marriage relationships should be like, what happens if you don't or if you get divorced, you know, all those different things. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Romans chapter 7, you have Paul talking about the struggles that he still has with sin. Um, you know, you can go down through the list there you know, 1 Corinthians chapter 11 about head coverings for women, uh, both spiritual and physical. Um, 
you know, different things like that. Hebrews chapter 11 is one of the greatest chapters on the subject of faith. Let's look here. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Okay? So faith then is something that you have to believe. Okay? You can't see it. You can't say, I believe in God because I see God. Uh, no, you don't. Um, I believe in heaven because I've seen it. Uh, no, you have to have faith. You say, I believe in hell because I've seen hell. No, you have to have faith. Although I will say, with the subject of hell, the Bible teaches that hell is in the heart of the earth. And you can look at any geology you know, textbook and they cut the earth open and the inside is molten nickel or something else they'll say. You know, the point is hell is a, real, is a reality. Now, you know, you have to have faith that there are souls burning down there, as the Bible says. Um, they're not in the grave, by the way. You know, they're in hell burning and screaming right now. But uh, faith is something that you have to have as a Christian. God's not going to do everything for you by sight. You say, well, I, I don't know if I could live by faith. Okay, here's your verse then. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. When you do something good for the Lord, do you have walk into your living room and there's a piece of gold sitting there? No. But the Bible says that God's going to reward you. Where's the reward at? You're laying up treasures in heaven. I have never seen my treasures that I have in heaven. Okay? I don't know what they look like. I'm not sure exactly what it's going to be like. You say, well, you have a, a sermon on the judgment seat of Christ. Yes, I do. And it says that there are going to be crowns. Well, I can imagine what a crown looks like in my mind according to earthly standards, but what does the heavenly crown look like? I don't know. I have no idea. You say, well, then how can you prove it's there? Because of something called faith. You see, you know, when you ask the Lord uh, something when you're praying and you say, Lord, I just really pray that you'll help me with such and such. And then that doubt comes into your mind a second or two later and says, he isn't going to help me. It's just going to fail. It's not going to work. You know what you're doing? You're not having faith. Your faith is wavering. See, and when you have faith that is unfeigned, unfeigned means, you could, another way to say it would be unfaked non-hypocritical faith. In other words, when you say, I believe the Lord's going to do this, then you better stick with it. Because if you're going around and you're in ministry, we'll say, and you say, I believe this Bible is true from the, from the cover to cover, from the beginning to end, like that. And in your heart, you're going, I don't believe that for one second. I believe this is just a translation. It's not as accurate as the original autographs. If we only had the original autographs and then, you know, blah, blah, you don't have faith. What you have is faith on, that is feigned. It's fake. It's hypocritical faith. A lot of people have that. You're not supposed to as a Christian. Turn back to 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6. Okay, it says here, From which some having swerved have turned aside unto vain jangling. Notice there, the charity out of a pure heart, good conscience, and of faith unfeigned. If you swerve from that, it says there, having turned aside unto vain jangling. That means they just let your mouth just flap, 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 just yap, 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 yap. You know, it's, and it's vain. You're not serving the Lord, you know. Every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment, whether it be good or bad, you know. You're going to give account for what you speak. That's why back in Proverbs, a lot of times you'll read that your words should be few. You shouldn't talk very much, okay. Unless you're talking and speaking for the Lord, a lot of your speech, you should try to control it. Don't be a big blabbermouth. Verse 7, Desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. And again, sounds very much like the Hebrew Roots Movement. They're going to be a teacher of the law. I am, you know, not. I am no longer Brian Denninger. I am Hassan Abilawaka or something, you know, and, and I'm a rabbi or something like this. And I'm going to teach you all about the Old Testament law and I'm going to teach it all in Hebrew or something. I don't need to do that, you know, and I'm not, I'm not cutting on Hebrew, I'm not cutting on the Jewish people, okay, I'm not trying to make fun, 
But what I'm saying is it irritates me when I see these people and they're trying to bring people back under the law and they're trying to tell you all about what the Old Testament really says and what the New Testament really would have said back in the first century before people corrupted it and all this, you know, liberty blabber. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to get you to deny Jesus Christ. It's ridiculous. They're trying to get people that are not saved. They're trying to get them to go to hell with them. And if you are saved, they're trying to get you off track so that you just go around with vain jangling all the time, talking about Hebrew and, and all this other stuff when you're not even a Jew. I mean, give me a break. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8 through 10. But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully. Okay? The Ten Commandments aren't bad. The Old Testament laws are not bad. But what's the, po what's the point of this? What, how do you use the Old Testament laws lawfully? Verse 9, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. Okay, the law is given to convict the sinner of their sin. Where would we be if we did not have the Ten Commandments? You'd say, well, I feel, I, I think, I, I kind of feel that I believe, you know. But see, we have God's written word. We have the Ten Commandments right here. And your conscience bears witness to that. Okay? Nobody out there, unless they're to totally perverted in their mind, nobody's going to argue with you that murder is wrong. When it says, the Bible says, thou shalt not kill, that's saying you're not to premeditatively go out and kill somebody. Say, I hate that guy, I'm going to go kill him. And figure it out, and you go out and kill the guy. It's not talking about a military type of a thing, um, or self-defense or something like that. It's not talking about that. It's talking about premeditated murder, is what that's talking about. Now, nobody's going to fight you on that, if they have any sense, anyhow. Alright? But you see there, somebody that is a, you know, murderer, talks about there in the, in the passage, you can go to them and you can say, let me show you what the law of God says. And see, you have violated the laws of God, therefore you are going to pay. When you stand before a holy, righteous God someday, you're going to go to hell. Why? Not because of my feelings being hurt or because of the person that you killed, their feelings being hurt or their family's feelings being hurt. You've sinned against a holy, righteous God. These are His laws. These aren't my laws. See? Galatians chapter 2, verse 16. Turn there. We're going to see another witness here to this thing of the purpose of the Ten Commandments. The purpose of the law in the Bible. Galatians chapter 2, verse 16 says, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law. Now look at this. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Oh, but I think that I can act like I'm Jewish and keep the Ten Commandments and earn heaven. Uh, you're going to earn hell if you do that. Read the book of Galatians. Uh, you're not going to get away from this thing of being justified by faith. All right, right now. Okay, that's important to understand too. Now go to Galatians 3.19. Another chapter over there. Galatians 3.19 Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions, like we read about there in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 9-10. through 10. It was added because of transgressions, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made, the Jews, and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Who's the mediator there? Jesus Christ. Now a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. See? Three in one. Galatians chapter 3, verse 21. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid, for if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise of faith by Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore? 
The law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith is come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. You say, okay, well then after I believe in Jesus by faith, then I just throw the Ten Commandments out and I can do whatever I want. No, that's not what it's saying. It's simply saying that you're not justified by keeping the law. Not before salvation, not after salvation. There's a lot of people that try to teach today, a lot of the free will Baptists, they try to teach this thing of you come to Jesus Christ by faith, but then you have to stay in faith. You have to stay in belief. You have to keep believing. You know, like the Catholics, they'll say, you say, uh, are you saved? They'll say, I am being saved. Uh, no, that doesn't cut it. Okay, your salvation is finished when the Lord saves you. Okay, when you come to God as a sinner, a broken sinner, and you believe by or through faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and God says, okay, I'm going to save you. At that point in time, you're now saved. You are sealed under the day of redemption. Today, right now in this dispensation. And again, things change when we hit the, when people hit, not we, I'm going to be leaving. When people hit the time of Jacob's trouble, things will change a little bit there. You can't take the mark of the beast at that point in time. If you do, you lose your salvation. All right, Revelation chapter 14, verses 9 through 11. Read it. Don't get mad at me. Read it. All right. But you see there the thing of you don't have to keep yourself saved. That's not the purpose of the law. The law right now in our present dispensation is to convict the sinner of their sin. The hardest thing that you can do in this world is to get people to drop their self-righteousness. Most people cannot imagine themselves being taken by a holy righteous God and thrown into a lake of fire for all of eternity to burn and to not burn up. The average person could not imagine a thing like that. Me? <laughs> Burn forever? <laughs> no, not me. I'm a good person. See? And the law comes in and says, no, you're not. Now I'm going to prove it. There's not a man on this earth, woman on this earth, child on this earth that, is not, that has lived their whole life without breaking one of the Ten Commandments. Everybody, everybody has broken at least one. And that's, you know, a very serious understatement. You know, we've all broken far more than just one commandment. But let's go back here to 1 Timothy, verse 11. It says here, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. Okay, that gospel was committed to Paul's trust. But here's the interesting thing. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18 through 21, you can read that some other time. It says that that gospel was also committed to your trust and my trust as well. If you're saved today, you have a ministry of, ministry of reconciliation. You are an ambassador for Jesus Christ. You have a responsibility in some way, somehow, to preach the gospel to people. Okay, That can be through gospel tracts. It can be through witnessing. It can be through internet ministry. It can be through all sorts of different things. Get a radio program. Write tracts. Uh, lots of things. Letters to the editor. Um, all kinds of different things. Some people preach on the street. Whatever. You have a ministry of reconciliation. Our job down here in this life is not to work for 40 or 50 years, save up a good retirement, go on vacation in Hawaii, you know, when you get older, and then have a retirement home and then die and, and you know, go, to, go home to heaven. That's not your job down here. Your job is to serve Jesus Christ. And you don't have to be a pastor to do that. All right. Don't fall for that one either. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Okay? The Lord is not interested in, in men and women being in ministry for him that are unfaithful. All right? Turn to James chapter 1. You know, the whole thing is when you get somebody that just has to see everything, I have to see proof, I have to see the Lord do this for me, and I have to see these signs and wonders all the time. The Lord has to prove to me that this thing is real. That's somebody who's unfaithful. Somebody who just says, you know what? I've studied this Bible now enough. I've read this book. I believe the King James Bible is God's pure, perfect word. I don't need to see all the proofs and everything else, and I have to go over 
and study all the manuscripts and all that other stuff to make sure it's accurately translated and everything. I don't need to see that stuff. I know the book is true. I'm going to go preach the book. This Bible right here in my hands. You know, somebody like that, the Lord will use. Let's look here. James chapter 1, verse 5 through 8. You say, well, I really don't know the Bible that well. Okay. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith. See there? Unfeigned faith. Let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Very interesting there. And I have met some Christians down through the years that are so double-minded. Oh, boy. You know, you just say, I remember this one guy the one time, and a uh, guy I used to know, and I'd say to him, he'd be like, I, don't, I just don't know what I'm supposed to do for the Lord. And I'd say, oh, well, you know, what are your ideas? What are your thoughts? Well, I've been on a few mission trips. So I'd like to go on a mission field. And I'd say, really? Well, that's, that's pretty neat. Okay, what, what type of an area would you like to go? Well, you know, for a while he was saying like Central America or something. Then he was thinking more towards Russia, you know. And, uh, and I said to him, well, praise the Lord. Then I would t start spending some time studying the Russian language. I'd start spending some time studying the Russian culture. Maybe look for some way to get over there and uh, take a mission trip and things. And he'd get all excited. Yeah, yeah, that sounds good. That's, man, that sounds good. Well, I really think the Lord's calling me to Russia, you know, and stuff. And I'd say, good, well, praise the Lord. Next time I'd see him, hey, how are things going on that preparations for that ministry? I don't think the Lord wants me to go to Russia. I don't think I'm supposed to be a missionary. Why not? Well, I just have messed up in my past, and I just don't know if I could ever be used of the Lord. And I, I just don't think, you know, what would I do about my job, and what would I do? With it? And this thing went on for years, and it was just double-mindedness, double-minded. Double One minute, it's, yeah, I'm going to go, I'm going to go, I'm going to serve the Lord. Next, it's, I don't think I can. What was his problem? He didn't have faith. He didn't have faith that God could use him at that point in time. Uh, right now, my wife and I, as I said earlier, we're looking for land to go and, and build and things. And, and, uh, and the, the state that we're going to, I haven't been there in over 20 years. Uh, and it's a good drive. It's going to be probably about a 12-hour drive for us to go to this place where we're looking. And I'm struggling. I'll be very honest with you. I'm struggling with it. I'm thinking to myself, what about this and what about that? What if this happens? What if that happens? But you know what I have to do? I have to have faith. I believe that the Lord has called us to this point and He's pointing to this area and I know that there are very, very few Bible believers in that area and uh, I actually heard that it's very much Catholic there and it's like, well, what better place to go? <laughs> you know, plenty of ministry opportunities there. But you know what? I have to have faith that the Lord is going to provide, that the Lord is going to take care of the situation, that the Lord is going to give us wisdom when we get there. See, that's very important. You have to have faith. Don't be like out here, it's windy right now. Don't be like a kite that's just blowing all over the place. You know, or like a wave. You get out there, a little sailboat on the, on, in the water, and it's blowing over this way, and then it blows back this way, and then it blows this way, and blows that way. Don't be that way as a Christian. Get things figured out, and then go that way. You're supposed to run a race. You don't run a race zigzagging back and forth across the track. You run straight. You keep your eyes forward. You don't look back over your shoulder. Unless it's a real quick like that, you know, you aren't running like this, running down the road, you know, or running over like this or something like that, or I think I'll spin around a couple times while I'm running, you know. You don't do that. You run straight. Turn back to 1 Timothy couple more verses here. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 13 and 14. It says here, Who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. Aren't you glad that God had enough mercy to save your worthless hide? 
I'm sure glad he saved my worthless hide. I'm sure glad that he looked past all the sins that I did in, in my lost life and said, you're rotten, you're miserable, but I'm going to save you anyhow, Brian. That blood is going to wash you clean. And my son's righteousness, that perfect sinless life that Jesus Christ lived on this earth, it's imputed to me. Just put down. And that rotten life that I lived before I got saved and even some things after I got saved to my shame, that rotten life was put on Jesus Christ on the cross and paid for there on the cross. And that's the way it is for you too if you're saved. Praise the Lord for His salvation. Verse 15. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Can you say a big amen to that? <laughs> Being a sinner saved by God's grace. Praise the Lord. Wonderful. And notice too there, a kick against the predestinated Calvinism beliefs. Okay? It's worthy of all acceptation. And of course the Calvinist chimes in and he says, that's all the elect. You know, <laughs> uh, it doesn't say that. All right? The blood of Jesus Christ is there for anybody to accept or reject. Most people reject. Not because God forced them to reject. Not because God created them as non-elect. And they've always been non-elect. You know. And I heard a guy recently say, you know, uh, it's kind of like, you know, is it a mistake to witness to a elect sinner or a elect Christian a year before God has predestinated them to be saved? <laughs> you know, see, it just Calvinism is a kooky system. All right, don't fall for it. All men can be saved. Okay. First Timothy chapter one verse sixteen. Howbeit, for this cause I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all longsuffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Isn't it interesting how much the Lord will allow some people to go through before their salvation? You know why that is? Because of he is long-suffering. God will put up with a lot. And a lot of times... The Lord will save the most wicked, rotten, evil person that you would never ever think that God would save them. But the Lord will. Okay? Pretty amazing. It's really getting windy here. Getting blown away. But uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 17. Now unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Did you see it again? Notice the three. Now unto the king, eternal, immortal, invisible. And it says the only wise God. But you see there are the three things again. Eternal, immortal, invisible. Well, I would say the eternal is Jesus Christ. The immortal is God the Father. And the invisible, well, the Holy Spirit. Interesting. Interesting. And there is only one God. The only wise God. Sorry Allah. Sorry Buddha. Sorry Confucius. Sorry to all the popes out there that think they're God. Uh-uh. Sorry. Only one God. Question. It says there be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Are you bringing honor and glory to God with your life? Revelation chapter 4, verse 11. Turn over there. Revelation 4, 11. Okay, it says here, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. God created you for His pleasure. As a matter of fact, God created all men and women for His pleasure. Most don't choose to bring glory and honor and power to the Lord. So they don't bring Him any pleasure in life. God does not look down at His creation and say, I hate all of them. No. He looks down and He looks for ones that will bring Him pleasure and bring Him joy. And as a Christian, you need to do that. Turn to Revelation chapter 5. 
Revelation chapter 5, verse 11 through 14 says, And I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beasts and the elders, and the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand, and thousands of thousands. That's you if you're saved right now. Saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth, and such as are in the sea, and all them, and all that are in them, heard I saying, Blessing, and honor, and glory, and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb forever and ever. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. So, giving glory and honor to the Lord isn't going to stop here in this life. You should do it down here, but we're going to be doing this thing for all of eternity. That's going to be wonderful. I love that. You know, we're going to be up there praising Jesus Christ forever. Okay? It's going to be great. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 18. Turn back there. Okay, it says here, This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare. Oh no, that sounds kind of militant, doesn't it? Yeah. Why? 2 Timothy 2.4 says, No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. Wait a second here. I don't remember signing up for the military. Well, I did never sign up for the branches of the American military. You know, any of the four branches. But you see, when I got saved, I got signed up to be a soldier for Jesus Christ. God chose us to be soldiers. Now, as soldiers, what are you supposed to do? Fight. War, a good warfare. Now, here's the interesting thing about being a soldier for Jesus Christ. You're going to have three things that you can fight. Okay? Either you're going to fight the enemy, or you're going to fight the brethren, or you're going to fight God. A carnal Christian will oftentimes fight the brethren, not for the right reasons either, by the way, but they'll often fight the brethren, and they'll especially fight against God. When God says, don't do that, thou shalt not, do not touch that, do not eat that, do not do this, do not, they'll say, I'll do what I want. And the Lord says, and I'll do what I want. I'll punish you. <laughs> I'll chasten you. See, you're not going to be able to get to a place where you don't fight, is what I'm trying to say. You will fight something as a Christian. You say, well, Brian, I just don't feel like I'm called into the ministry. I just don't feel like I could ever give tracts to people, and I don't feel like I should speak against things, and I, I just want to kind of blend in. Okay, then you'll fight the Lord. And you'll eventually start to fight me and other believers on YouTube. Because when we talk about sin, we're going to convict you because you're, you're doing those sins, and so you're going to start to fight against us. The point I'm trying to make is, brother, sister, in the Lord, you are a soldier. You are to war a good warfare. Fighting against your brothers and sisters in Christ that are right in line with Scripture. I'm not talking about exposing error and false doctrine. But I'm saying fighting against your brothers and sisters in Christ and fighting against the Lord and doing what you want with life, that's not a good warfare. That's a bad warfare. And you're going to answer for that. Turn back to 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 19. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 19 says, Holding faith and a good conscience. Hmm, that sounds familiar. Which, ha which, uh, excuse me, which some having put away concerning faith have made shipwreck. Now it's interesting there, if you remember verse 5, if you look at that, it says, Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. So you have both verse 5 and verse 19 there, both saying you need to have faith and a good conscience. And I can guarantee you, if you want to wreck your life as a Christian, the best thing to do is, number one, stop believing by faith and require physical proof and sight to prove God's existence. That'll do a good job of wrecking your faith and your life as a Christian. Number two, start messing around with sin and hide it from people. This will destroy your good conscience. And I can tell you right now, one of the most prominent sins out there among the brethren 
right now, one of the ones that's being done the most is pornography. And that thing will wreck your conscience. I used to look at this stuff years ago. I understand. I know what it's like. And you get around the brethren and you want to think pure thoughts, but you're mentally undressing women there. Why? Because that's what pornography is. That's how they do it. And so you might have an outward, nice, you know, little whited sepulcher thing going on there, you know. But inwardly, you got a rotten conscience. You don't have a good conscience. You need to get that thing taken care of, brethren. I'm telling you right now, listen to my studies on that. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 20. Of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. You say, Paul wouldn't name anybody's names, would he? Uh, yes, he just did. Hymenaeus and Alexander. Okay? And what did they do? They made a, a wreck of their lives, a shipwreck. If you ever see a picture of a shipwreck, you know, you get the boat it, it smashed on the rocks over there, and you look and it's got a big crack in the side, and there's all the people's luggage floating out across the thing and furniture, and there's a boat that's wrecked, and there's oil spilling out, people floating in the water, and what a mess. You can do that with your life as a Christian. You can make a mess of your life. Okay? But you say there, what about this thing of delivering somebody to Satan? How do you do that? Well, very simple. And I've done this thing a couple times myself. You get to speak into another Christian, and this doesn't work with a Satan or with a lost person because really they already are owned by Satan, so you can't really deliver somebody who's owned by Satan to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. He's already got them. This this verse is talking about somebody who is saved. And what you do is you come to him and you say, you know what? Um, I'm saying this to you in love, brother, sister but I know that you're involved in this sin. And you need to repent of that thing because, not because of me, but because the Bible says, and you give them scripture. And you'll find a carnal Christian once in a while, and they'll say, you show them scripture after scripture after scripture, and you get them to a point and they say, you know what, I feel what I'm doing is right, and I don't care what the Bible says. You see, they just confessed it before you, and maybe even some other people, they, but they confessed it before you, and they confessed it before God. And that's how you deliver somebody to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. You put the Bible in front of them, and you say, Thus saith the Lord. And they say, I don't care about that. Well, guess what? They're no longer ignorant of what the Bible says, how the Bible condemns their sin. And so now, the Lord looks down and He says, uh, and Satan's over there, you know, over going, can I destroy him? Can I destroy him? Can I destroy him? Can I get him? Can I get him? Can I get him? Please, please, please. The Bible says he's the accuser of the brethren. And he's over there, come on, let me get, let me, let me attack him. Please, please. Like he did with Job, you know. And the Lord says, well, they rejected my word. Go ahead. And the devil goes, ah, oh, right. I've been waiting for this for a long time. And he goes down and he attacks them. I've seen that thing happen. I've told this story before, but I'll say it one more time here as we're closing. Um, there was a time when I knew a man, an older man, and, uh, and we got into this big argument about the King James Bible. And he told me, you know, that, that uh, there are manuscripts and there's proof and things that, that are better than the King James and whatever, whatever. And I said, okay. I said, you use the King James though? He said, yeah, of course I use the King James Bible. I'm not going to use one of these new versions. And I said, but you said it's not accurate. It's just a translation. It's not God's inspired word, you know, whatever. And he said, yeah. And I said, okay, let me ask you a question then. See, at this point in time, I could have backed off. I could have just said, okay, whatever. I'll just let him be ignorant. You know, let him that's ignorant be ignorant, you know, still. No, what I did is I said, I'm going to come in here and I'm going to make this guy accountable to God. And I didn't do it out of spite. I didn't do it because I wanted to hurt the guy. But I came and I said, let me ask you a question. You use the King James Bible, but you don't believe the King James Bible. Is that true? He said, yeah, I guess you could say it that way. I said, all right, could you show me a copy of God's perfect word on this earth? Can you show me a book that is God's perfect word without error? You know what he said? He said, no such book exists. Now see, at that point in time, he just called God a liar. Because 
Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. This book is God's word. And he said, no, it isn't. That verse, John 17, 17, that I just quoted, that's a lie. That's what he just said. So that thing there where I got him to confess before me, before God, then the Lord said, okay, I'm going to have to turn you over to Satan. That is how you deliver somebody to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. And why? You say, well, Brian, why would you do a thing like that? Why didn't you just leave him be ignorant? Because he's spreading his heresy to other people, you see. And you see, there, there have been other situations too, by the way, I'll say this, where people are in very serious error and I say, you're attacking me? You're telling me I'm wrong? What's the scripture for it? Well, I can't point to any scriptures, but I know you're wrong. But the Bible says that what I'm doing is right. I don't care what the Bible says. I believe you're wrong. I can't give you any scripture to prove that, but I know you're wrong, Brian. What am I doing? I'm delivering them to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Why? Because they've just departed from the Lord. They've just said, I don't care what you say. God, I don't care what you have to say. I'm just going to have my own beliefs. I want to be above this book. I'm not going to have any book on the earth that's going to judge me. And at that point in time, the Lord just says to Satan, go on in there. And this guy I was talking about earlier that denied the King James Bible, within 24 hours, his wife gave him divorce papers. And that divorce went on for about three years. It cost him over $15,000. Why? Because he had been delivered to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. And that man is now an older man. He's a broken man. Why? God delivered him to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. And if you get somebody that is so arrogant and they will not repent, they will not change, and they're spreading their heresies out there, you have a right and a duty to confront them with the Word of God and to say, Brother, sister, you are wrong according to Scripture. And I'm going to show you why you're wrong. And if you reject what I'm saying, you're rejecting the book. You're not rejecting me. And if you reject this book, God's going to speak to you. God's going to deliver you over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, just like we read about there. Be very careful about that. Okay? So that's going to be it for 1 Timothy chapter 1. Uh, next week we'll be doing 1 Timothy chapter 2. That's it. Thank you very much for watching.